And Top Story is always brought to you by Vodafone. The opposition National Democratic Congress is tonight taking its fight to secure the electoral victory of James Dachikwe Singh to the doorstep of the Attorney General, Godfrey Yabuadami. They accuse the AG of acting irresponsibly by making insulting comments to secure an expedited daily court hearing. Now, Mr. Kwek Singh's lawyers today urged the court to halt the criminal trial and resume after the June 27 by-election in Asin North. They had the support of some constituents who throng the law court complex to back that demand. Listen to a few of them. We are there, there are questions, baby. Hey, 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 hey. We want to show that the man has not committed any crime. Even criminals who, who commit murder, they, are, they, they can't arraign them every day. How much somebody who has left Canada 45 years in Canada has come to serve his people? And you are treating him as a civilian, and it's a, it's a criminal. It is not fair. It is not fair. My brother, the time they sworn in justification, he had a certificate that shows that he had renounced his citizenship with Canada and is now a Ghanaian. Is that not so? So why now that the citizen is not a Ghanaian? It is not fair. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know how people sit down and then they just think that everybody should just follow them. No, it, it is not fair. The man is a Ghanaian. The moment you tender your your, this, your citizenship to Canadian this in law, you terminate being a citizen of Canada. So I see no reason why they still prolong that sort of, you know, that hula baloo about his citizenry. He's a Ghanaian, and you have come back home, and you have tended his citizen, uh, tended his citizenship as a, 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 a Canadian citizen. The why this hula baloo? Um, let's bring in our court correspondent who joins us right now. Uh, Blake, tell me, how significant were the numbers of individuals who thronged the courts today to back James Atukwesi? Uh Please unmute for me, James, uh, on, on, on Zoom. Okay, I can hear him. We're trying to fix that, but uh, a number of them were there today as we try and fix that uh, connection. Uh, to uh, Joseph Akable, who no, has been in court. Yes, I can hear you, Joseph. I'm just uh, curious to know the numbers that throng the courts today. How significant were they? In fact, uh, more than 20, but I wouldn't say they will be beyond 50 in terms of those who were outside uh, the court premises to monitor proceedings. In terms of the courtroom itself, there were some that managed to make their way in there. For those ones you are looking at, more than 20 individuals so all in all if you are going to put a round figure to it obviously less than 100 but inching closer to that figure in terms of those who came in into the courtroom and outside the courtroom to throw their support behind james jachi Grayson. let's go back into the courtroom for a second because it was a pretty tense moment between the lawyers particularly lawyers for james that you're what specific comment did the ag make last week which appears to have upset them in fact, it was during the arguments that were being made, they were cross-examining lawyers for Mr. Quaysen were cross-examining um, the witness of the state, the first prosecution witness. At the till end, the lawyer, Terry Waja, did indicate to the court that the Supreme Court had already declared his election unconstitutional, so the by-election is scheduled to take place on the 27th. And this is a national assignment. And so they asked in the court that instead of coming back on the 20th, they should come back on the 27th. The Attorney General, the case at this point is being conducted by the Deputy Attorney General, Alfred Chiaibwa. The Attorney General, who was then seated, now came in and said that he is constrained to talk because of what the council had said. And he said he's introducing political matters which are extraneous. He's saying the accused is involved in a national assignment. Who gave him a national assignment? It is a selfish quest to contest in this election, knowing very well that there is a criminal case pending against him. The Supreme Court has declared your election unconstitutional, and you know that you are facing criminal prosecution, uh, which could result in a conviction. And so he made a point that it's in the interest of justice that the matter be expeditious, the case be heard on day to day. I pray that the subsequent adjournment after today be on day to day basis. And so those were the comments that the AG made, which eventually the court came to the conclusion that it was going to fix the date for beyond because already the court had indicated I was going to sit on the 16th, which was the date that I was sitting last week, then the 20th and the 21st. And so the court decided that it was going to now continue starting from the 20th to 21st and then do the 23rd as well as 
and what has been the reaction specifically? I know you've been talking to lawyers for the NDC and, and James yeah. Atukwesen as well. In fact, this did not sit well with them at all. In court, uh, lead counsel Chachuchikata told the court that as far as they are concerned, they consider those statements to be uh, very unfair and justified. And he called it, he says, were needless attacks and unacceptable attacks that were leveled against James Jachi question. And he makes the point that it is in the interest of justice that the court takes note mm -hmm. of the fact that he's contesting elections and needs ample time to conduct his affairs by way of his campaign. This view is equally shared by Abraham Maliba, who is director of legal of the NDC. It is fair. We got what we wanted. Uh, once the Attorney General complains of short service and they needed to respond to our application, it's only fair that the court gives them an opportunity to, 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 to reply to our our, our application. I mean, we understand he has some issues with the comments that the AG made. So to call somebody irresponsible when he's embarked on, on a democratic process, and that because he's embarked on that democratic process, he's irresponsible, shouldn't be coming from an attorney general and a minister of justice. If I'm a minister of justice, you must ensure that justice is done to all manner of persons. And so that was an irresponsible comment from the attorney general. He doesn't act like an attorney general. And I agree with senior uh, Chachi Kata that his comments were irresponsible. So in terms of what you'll be expecting to do tomorrow, you'll be making a strong case for an adjournment to be taken to give him that enough time? Is the uh, problem has been with the day-to-day -day hearing, the daily hearings, and we shall make a strong case for the matter to be adjourned beyond 27th. Don't forget that he's undertaking a national assignment, and that's the national assignment the Attorney General doesn't understand. For the Attorney General, it must be Akufado inviting you to the flag serve house and giving you work. But he doesn't know the Constitution also imposes a national duty. So that's the kind of attorney general you have. Vision, narrow vision. And Joseph, you got a reaction from the team from the Attorney General's office? Yes, Evans. Uh, Deputy Attorney General Alfred Chuyaboa uh, disagrees and actually makes the point that the reason why they want time to respond to what is being said is to address some of these matters. And they do, do not think that on the said day, the Attorney General, Godfrey Yabwadami, did see anything which they find to be problematic. Counsel for the accused person made a point that the AG on the last agenda said the accused person is being irresponsible from what he said in court today. If that is containing the affidavit in support, then we will need time to also respond to say Because every single word that the AG uttered on the last agenda date was proper. In fact, he was able to convince the court the need for the matter to be heard on daily basis. So we are at sea as to why they are talking about an attack on the accused person, but we are, we are waiting. I mean, but what is irresponsible about a person qualified deciding to contest an election? They are saying that AG said it was, he was, like he was being irresponsible. I, I, we don't know how, why, why, why they are coming by such a deposition. But as I said, we don't know why they've stated exactly in the affidavit in support. We just heard him. So we just want to say that for David, that we can respond appropriately. And as far as you are concerned, what you'll be asking for tomorrow is that the dates that have been agreed should continue and they shouldn't take that long adjournment to enable him to contest the election as he wants to. It's not about he not being allowed to contest the elections. He has a right to contest. The state also has a right to hear cases pending in court. So it's going to be a position, even though it's not been served, that the court properly exercise a discretion in granting adjournment on daily basis. And that's what we're going to maintain. Bring in now uh, Abraham Maliba, who is a director of uh, legal for the NDC. He will join us uh, pretty shortly uh, for a conversation on this. As we've been hearing, this uh, particular matter is one that will be decided on pretty shortly. Uh, Joseph, from everything we've heard, um, the court will have to make a decision on this. Uh, do we know um, when this will happen? you have a legal arguments in terms of the side that believes that yes the court should take some time off and come back in fact the proposed date that mr chikata suggested was the 28th of june that will be a day after the by election would have taken place for the trial to continue then there is the ag side that hold a view that look the court has already taken dates the court supposed to sit tomorrow and continue with the trial and continue on the 23rd and if possible i mean we'll know when the court will take the next date in terms of the hearing to continue and so those two opposing views will be argued out tomorrow and we understand that the court would most likely make a decision after hearing those legal arguments and that will
decide or determine what happens. Besides the two questions, lawyers are already will also be in the Supreme Court on the 22nd. And that is in respect of challenging his decision, the Supreme Court judgment that uh, declared this election unconstitutional. We understand they are filing a motion asking the Supreme Court to give them more time to file for a review of that particular decision. And so that is also another leg of the matter that they hope that once they get this one on hold, they'll be able to pursue that one as well, while the campaign activities also take place as well. And so they have those legal hurdles that they are looking for to reach some form of conclusion yeah. that could afford them ample time to prosecute the campaign that is taking place in Asen North as well. Uh, just to thank you very much. Ibrahim Maliba is with me right now on the phone. He is the director of legal for the NDC. Mr. Maliba, thanks for your time here on Top Story. Thank you for having me. I, I'm curious why you seem opposed to this daily hearing. I mean, you, you lawyers always tell us that uh, once you delay a trial, you, you're denying justice. Justice delayed is justice denied. Here you're getting expedited daily hearing. Why is that an issue? And justice hurried is justice buried. Article 19 E of the Constitution provides that the accused person must be given ample time and facility to defend himself. If you impose daily hearing on the accused person, when will his lawyers retire and then have consultations as well as the briefing and then plan for the next day? That apart, in this particular case, we have somebody who is standing before the court, but as it were, we are aware he's also contesting for the seats in uh, Asen North. Now, you have a situation where the lawyers are saying that this is a national assignment because under the Constitution, democratic processes are considered as national assignments. For you to have a situation where the accused person will be coming to court every day when we know that in in less than uh, five days' time, he will be standing for elections. It's not fair. In any case, this attorney general has been prosecuting people. Which of the cases has he asked that those persons should be coming to court every day? Why this one? Yeah, because this is an important matter. It, it borders on the balance in parliament, and that is why it has to be decided, and it has to be decided expeditiously. There's nothing more important than when a person's conduct has led to the death of Ghanaians has led to people losing their jobs, has led to people losing their money. So I'm talking about number one. If you ask the people of Ghana today, they should vote. Which of the two should have expedited trial? I'm sure you know that Ghanaians will go for number one. But you also concede, I mean, it was his decision and your party as well for him to run in this particular by-elections. The court case and the by-election contest are two distinct things. Yes. But we see nothing more than persecution in this one. This is not a prosecution. And so we see the Attorney General, and he made that clear. He made those comments. Indeed, before the last Friday comments he made, which we are up in arms against him, he had stated that um, uh, James uh, James, uh, uh, James James would, would suffer the same fate like Adamu Sakande. These are all prejudicial comments. Attorney generals don't behave that way. This is the only attorney general whose conduct threatens the, the, the justice delivery system. You cannot be prosecuting somebody and already threatening him that he will suffer the same fate as Adamu Sakande. Yeah, but, but, but isn't that why he's, he's, he's prosecuting him? I mean, is it stating the obvious, is you know? No, an attorney general and the minister of justice to not make prejudicial comments. And that's why he's a minister of justice, which means that he must do justice to even the accused person. It is, not, it is unjust and unfair for an attorney general to be attempting to be, uh, as it were, um, uh, harassing the accused person. Well, the court will have to make a decision on, on the application you filed. Thank you very much. And that's uh, Director of Legal for the NDC. Well, uh, today, former Minority uh, Chief Whip and NDC MP for Asawasi, Muntaka Mubarak, has been detailing what will happen in the worst-case scenario where James Dachi Kweising is convicted and imprisoned. He says Mr. Kweising will hold on to his seat, even from prison, if he wins a by-election. I can assure you, when I was a Minority Whip, I prepared him. I prepared him for today. 
and I'm sure the new leadership are continuing with him. And I can bet you, I am very confident that Jasu Kwesi is going to survive this. He will? He will, by the grace of God. Survive what? The elections or the criminal election, case against him? He will survive it. all. I mean, look, between you and I, I, I mean, a lot of things, I, I, you don't need to put it on in, 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 in the public. I have told him, Chief, you may end up in prison, but you will keep the seat. How? Yes. Kwame Kwame was I mean, in prison when he first became a member of parliament. A lot of freedom fighters, a lot of people had gone to prison for wrong reasons, people for no wrong done, they survived it. But and when these things were happening in the initial state, you know, he was, because this is somebody who had lived uh, a very long time abroad. I mean, he's not a young man, so he's used to a system where system works. The system works to everybody. I mean, you could predict how things go happen. And then he comes into a system where you cannot predict anything. And it's like, initially, he gets almost depressed. So to prepare that person for him to get to where he is, believe me, if this thing, I want to tell you, I can tell you in confidence, if this thing had happened, say, within the first six months of him becoming a member of parliament, maybe it will be a different thing. But it's happening at the time that he is really prepared mentally for it. And I can bet you, you heard him say that, look, if you want, get me a room in the court where I have to be sleeping in the court and attending the court, listen, I will still win there. Uh, that's all we needed. But if, for him to be mentally tough and be ready to go through all the hell that he may be put through and still win this. I just want to point out to you when you make the point that he may even end up in prison but still keep the seat. That's constitutionally impossible. That's possible. Because, because once you're convicted of a crime, you I cannot was, be a member I, of No, it's not true. I was in this house when Damagarabi was uh, incarcerated. We continue to believe that it was wrongly. He, he was wrongly incarcerated. And we, we continue to believe in that. We appealed. He kept his seat till he was pardoned. During President Kufa, I was in this house. All what matters for us, next week, Tuesday, Jatu is going to keep the seat. They can do their worst. But is this position grounded in law? And the precedent that he just cited, in this worst-case scenario, if indeed he's convicted, can he indeed hold on to that seat from the prison cell if he wins the by-elections. Let's uh, bring in right now lawyer Martin Kwebu, who joins us on the telephone line right now. Mr. Kwebu, thanks for your time here on Top Story. He cites the uh, president of uh, Dana Bodakwi, who was in jail for 10 years and was subsequently released when he was granted a pardon. Uh, is he grounded in law for this, this particular president that he cites? Yes, Evans. To the extent that it happened, so you will always know that there is a... Uh, uh, a difference between the law on paper and then the law in action, uh, and, or better still, so how it works practically. Yes, so that if somebody is convicted, it, it, it will take processes. Just like you remember the articulation, so when they were done in the Supreme Court, you say that they, um, they had to write to Parliament, Parliament had to write to EC, etc., as required by the representation of people's law. Right, so there are processes. So what is mean? What it means is that yes, you may have a conviction on paper, but it will take a lot more to be able to enforce. And that within that period, they can have uh, what do you call it an appeal. And then as part of the appeal, they can uh, apply that they shouldn't uh, this suspension or manner of other uh, remedies available within the law. Interesting point you make there, but there are other instances where the court has held that once you're convicted, you vacate your seat. In the cases I'm watching, and then Adamusa Kande, who, which is well, another very similar case to what we are currently dealing with, they all had to vacate that seat. Yes, so that's why. So you still come back to the same thing that I'm watching. Was it the same day? Was no, it the no, same no, it day? In fact, See, in fact, the, 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 the parliament gave him a, a carte blanche until. Uh, Professor Kwekwasari went to court and challenged it. The high court ruled against him, and then the appeals court over ten days, and then he lost. He had to declare the seat. Uh, excellent. So that's due process. So that's the same thing Mutaka is saying that they will challenge it, and within that period, yes, uh, he can then contribute as a member of parliament. This is not the first time. Remember, even uh, I mean, well, not the first time. Other countries, you even have the right to exhaust 
all the accused allowed by law before you start the sentence. You see, you remember the case of Lula, President Lula of Brazil. The first time he was convicted and the rest. They didn't, he didn't go to jail. He was out and then did his accuse. And you see, we are, big, we are growing as a country. We are middle income now, right? Lower middle income. We should relax the laws a bit. You see, especially Jassi Chris's case where you, you heard what Amaliba said. What, what is Jassi Chris's prosecution bringing to me, Evans? Look, we, we are hungry. We have an arrow string on our neck. We are not looking at uh, the citizens, millions who are dying. And we say Jassi Chris, we are spending all the time on it. Look, Evans, I think that as Ghanaians, there should be a spontaneous reaction. Let's gather a million votes. A million votes begging the attorney general petition or whichever word you like that we should stop this prosecution. I don't see what prosecuting that situation brings to me as a Ghanaian. Rather, I'm troubled that we are hungry, we are starving, the government is not paying our uh, bonds, etc. And we are spending so much on a criminal prosecution, interested in prosecuting that situation. Look, there's a disconnect. Do you see that currently? There is a bill in Parliament seeking to allow dual citizens to what? Contest as MPs. And at the same time, you have the Attorney General in court prosecuting somebody for uh, being a dual citizen and attempting uh, yeah, for having he, he, contested he, he, in Ghana. He's simply enforcing the existing law. As and when Parliament agrees to amend that clause, then it takes effect. But I'm grateful uh, for joining us and uh, with, with your thoughts on this uh, matter as introduced by the former Minority Chief Whip Muntaka Mubarak and that full interview as on PM Express later uh, tonight. LA you've just been listening there uh, to lawyer Martin Pebu. Uh, a lot of controversial subjects and issues around the Asin North by election. I want to take you to Asin North uh, specifically where the campaign has been in full swing. Uh, a man who has been following the campaigns on the ground for us is uh, Kojonyako and he joins us in the studio. Kojonyako, the NPP, they are deploying some of their big guns. Uh, they, they, in 2016, won that particular seat and they took it back from the NDC. They've been deploying uh, the former member of parliament for that area to help them campaign and win the seat back. Indeed, uh, it is not only that member of parliament who is currently in the campaign. In fact, both political parties are now, I mean, heating up their campaigns. They are, they are running separate campaigns. So they have taken every town in the constituency so they have deployed members of parliament former ministers of state current ministers of state current mps and they so if you go to asin india someone is there if you go to asin Ekropon, someone is there so they are running separate separate campaigns um ahead of the elections on tuesday so um this member of parliament in 20 uh, who won in 2016 uh, abna is currently backing um the current um mpp candidate uh, charles opoku and so uh she she says that voting for Charles Opoku will be the greatest uh, thing that the people would ever do. My message to you, the people of Asin Angel, is very short. Give the same support you once extended to Kennedy Japan and myself to Charles Opoku. I implore you to give them the same support. I believe you that once you decide to do it, you will do it. This is because once you are voting for us again, then you know that it's all about development. I'm tired to hear that Abna, since your exit, we've been lagging behind in terms of development. Because you are not here, everything is at a standstill. I'm tired of hearing that. For now, the opportunity beckons. Charles Opoku has been offered you to continue where I left off. I am pleading with you, vote for him and let's win so we can bring you more development. Well, let's sample the scene from the NDC. They've also been on the ground. I want to bring in the Deputy General Secretary of the party, Musa Fagbani. Musa Fagbani, thanks for your time here on Top Story. And you listen to the MPP. They are there on the ground and the campaign is in full swing. But your face on the ballot, James that you're facing, is having to come to court and now will possibly have to do this on a daily basis unless the court says otherwise. Um, how is it affecting your campaign on the ground? I know you've been there yourself. Thank you very much, Evans, for having me. I, I think basically 
we are not affected in any form or shape uh, by the machination of uh, government and concurrently the orders of the court. What is very important is that we are on the ground. Um, the people understand that clearly injustice is being done to justification. The orders and position of the court does not sit with the spirit of fear, fair hearing. And so we are complaining. Uh, you've heard what the lawyers have said. Except to say that we have a hot-headed attorney general who himself have misled the president on soundless occasions. Besides that, our campaign is ongoing. The situation is resolute. He is committed. You've, you've seen our national communication of such an agency who is leading uh, 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 the, the MP throughout his processes and campaign activities. I mean, everything is under control. The MPP is shivering because they are not boasting of putting that uh, food on the table of the people of Asia, not except to use machinations and other means to try and frustrate the NDC's campaign. It will fall in the water. It won't work. It won't wash. NDC is committed to ensuring that we retain this seat for the situation in the interest of the people of Asinot. Thank you very much, Mustafa Bande. Uh, he's a deputy general secretary of the NDC. Well, the NPP team on the ground in full force. We'll get to hear from them also. Uh, live here on News Night now on Joy 99.7 FM.